if there is one aggressor, it's going to be China. Yeah. Uh, so the 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 level of paranoia uh, with the Chinese leadership, because one thing the Chinese leadership lack is trust mm -hmm. within themselves and with others. <laughs> they don't trust anybody else, and others don't trust them. Mm -hmm. So if there is no trust, it's very difficult to maintain relationship over longer time. Because you always live in suspicion and yeah. who is going to do what. So that is why when I checked with Chinese scholars, they said that not more than three Politburo members can meet together without the uh, permission of the president. Mm. Uh, this convention was there, but it was reinforced more during Xi Jinping's time. And what does that say? That manifests that they are afraid of internal coup. Hello and welcome to The Gist on Strat News Global. Good evening, I'm Surya Vindadran and this evening we have with me the Sikyong of the Central Tibet Administration in India, Mr. Pempa Sering. Sir, welcome, glad to have you. Thank you for having me. Sir, uh, we've been reading some reports about um, a renewed Chinese efforts to uh, culturally assimilate um, or cynicize uh, young Tibetans. Uh, and I understand uh, that while uh, earlier there were reports of mass incarceration of uh, uh, Tibetans, uh, is this a new, more recent development? Oh, it has been happening over the years, but now it is becoming a more intensified under President Xi Jinping. Uh, at one time, we used to really fear demographic aggression because it's only six, seven million Tibetans yeah. on that 2.5 million square kilometers of land, and only only seven, six, seven Tibetan, uh, six, seven million Tibetans, and it's 1.4 billion. We I mean, and we thought that Tibet would be completely overwhelmed by the majority Han Chinese. But uh, maybe also uh, because China's population is also declining and it's not possible for every Chinese to live on the Tibetan plateau. You mm -hmm. need that lung. And they come only to those areas where uh, they, make, they can make money in towns and cities. They don't mm -hmm. go to rural areas where they have to do hard mm -hmm. labor for livelihood. So that has not happened as much as we feared. So the next assault from the Chinese government is now how do we turn every other nationality into a Chinese? Mm -hmm. So that is under Xi Jinping, one nation, one language, one culture kind of policy at the expense of all other nationalities. So you're striking at the very root of the identity of people. In the case of Tibetans, our language comes from India. Yeah. Our Buddhism also came from India. So we are an extension of Indian culture. We are proud to be repository of one part of ancient Indian wisdom because we must have translated all the available Buddhist texts into Tibetan in 8th century uh, and thereby we are proud to be a custodian of one part of ancient Indian wisdom. Now China is striking at that, taking Tibetan children away from their families uh, put them in boarding school. So we are talking about a million children between the age of 6 to 18 in boarding school out of 7 million total population. And the last time we checked, below the age of 6, between the age of 3 to 6 or so, it used to be several thousands in uh, boarding schools, mm -hmm. nearby boarding schools. Now it has gone up to 150,000. Mm -hmm. So the age limit is also coming down. And then the focus is more on Chinese language, Chinese version of history, Chinese communist ideology and how to maintain their loyalty to the Communist Party. Mm. So thereby you are completely brainwashing the younger generations of Tibetans. And that's why when I spoke at uh, the seminar yesterday also, I mentioned, of course, it is very detrimental for the Tibetan population if this continues for another several decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, this also has a security implications on India because yeah. Tibetans always looked up to India as the land of Aryavrat, the the land of the Buddha. And we have this huge respect for uh, India and the Indian people. And then, of course, the government and people of India have been very kind since we came into exile. So that equation will also change. 
if people change. So tell me, in this situation where you are seeing so many of your young people being uh, culturally, you know, their Tibetan identity being uh, uh, being wiped out, what would you expect from India to do, given the fact that relations with China are not good? What would you expect from India? No, relations uh, with China being good or not depends on who is the more belligerent yeah. uh, party. Uh, in this case, uh, China is the belligerent party. India has always been a very defensive country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I always said, if there is something that we know about China, having lived on that plateau for so many centuries as neighbor with China, China respects only strength, yeah. not weakness. So they have, over the years, tried to contain India through its uh, policies or support with or its relation with Pakistan over many decades. We live in India. We know how India's foreign policy has been so centric on Pakistan and Jammu Kashmir. Now the whole equation has changed. India is a growing power. India has the strength to stand up on its position. And India is standing up to its position and its values, democratic values. So then only you command respect from the Chinese. Yeah. So that is a very important uh, development that has taken place uh, over the last few years. And uh, So do you expect that as India's strength and power grows, it will uh, influence the Chinese to uh, perhaps talk to India more? and then indirectly perhaps influence their policy in Tibet? The, my analysis of why China's belligerence on the Indian border or saber-rattling with Taiwan or assertiveness in the South China Sea or with Senkaku or Daewoo Islands with Japanese is that they keep these hotspots burning. Mm -hmm. Because you look at Ladakh, the place in Galwan area, I Except for the some greeneries or the banks of the rivers, nothing, nothing there. Or mountains. So what are you fighting for, actually? There. Yeah. So, of course, Indian analysts say these are ways to contain China, India, uh, that India does not grow beyond certain thing. Uh, but at the same time, my uh, thinking is that China has become very insecure today. Mm -hmm. So everything that's coming out of the Chinese leader's mouth is security, security, yeah. security. And that also creates a sense of fear in the Chinese people's mind that, again, the foreigners are going to come and invade yeah. China, which is not really the truth. So they try to create that atmosphere. And if there is a threat to the survival of the Communist Party, depending on the severity of that threat, they will attack one of these places. Mm -hmm. So till such, a, till such a time, I don't see any... Uh, uh, immediate danger from the Chinese side because their econo economy is in the doldrums, yeah. uh, for starting from the rural governments to the banking sector to the housing uh, collapse and uh, the, the, the debt economies that are not working, BRI programs that are not uh, going as they expected, yeah. and their foreign exchange reserves will also come down if the GDP growth is not as much as it used to be. And if they have don't have too much trade surplus with other countries, they don't then they don't have the uh, reserve to splurge it on Belt and Road Initiative or space technology or, or artificial intelligence or military equipment. As I say China needs to be more introspective. Yeah. They point fingers at everybody else and say they are trying. Everybody else is at fault. A problem for China, but whereas China is fueling military expense of all the other countries. Look at Japan. Prime Minister Kishida is now very strong on spending on defense, yes. and Taiwan has to spend. There's no choice for them. Australia is investing in nuclear submarines, even though they are far away. Now, India has to spend more. We all know how much India is spending on infrastructure development and, uh, and, and the new uh, defense ties with France or Germany or U.S., but India is also in a very difficult position because yeah. of the growing Russia China relations. And if India if China were to attack India today, I think India would be in a very difficult position very, yeah. with spare parts and yeah. the militarized supplies not coming through from Russia. So it's a very new well, 
scenario that is developing uh, new dynamics and mm -hmm. equations uh, coming up. So it's very interesting times. So I'd like to touch upon the point you made that uh, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party appear insecure. Is this, um, what are they insecure about? Uh, I think the primary focus is internal, isn't it? Influence. A mass public uprising against the Communist Party. We saw some evidence of that during the COVID time, sure. you know, uh, not too long ago, I think last year itself. Is that <coughs> primary fear here? I think uh, if the, because nobody is going to attack China yeah. outside. Mm. India is not going to attack China. Yeah. NATO is not going to attack China. None of the neighboring states have the capacity or the will to uh, attack China. So if there is only if there is one aggressor, it's going to be China. Yeah. Uh, so the 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 level of paranoia uh, with the Chinese leadership, because one thing the Chinese leadership lack is trust mm -hmm. within themselves and with others. <laughs> they don't trust anybody else, and others don't trust them. Mm -hmm. So if there is no trust, it's very difficult to maintain relationship over longer time. Because you always live in suspicion as yeah. who is going to do what. So that is why when I checked with Chinese scholars, they said that not more than three Politburo members can meet together without the uh, permission of the president. Mm. Uh, this convention was there, but it was reinforced more during Xi Jinping's time. And what does that say? That manifests that they are afraid of internal coup. Mm. But then now the Things have changed, uh, unlike the previous Politburo, where you have uh, normally they keep people from the former presidents, like Chiang Zemin's people, or Hu Jintao's people. Now that Chiang Zemin is no more, Hu Jintao's people should be there to protect him. Yeah. That is the system. That's how it <laughs> works. Now, this time, it's all his people, seven people. So it's one one hand, you have Xi Jinping and the six other people. And it's supposed to be all his own people. Mm. So if you listen to the Chinese people's reaction to the developments in Russia with Putin and Wagner, uh, Prigozhin, uh, there were some YouTubers in China who were, we did a very good analysis of how people viewed that. And China showed that for only a few hours when it started. Mm. And when the story, the story started revolving around Prigozhin's relationship with Putin over 30 years, being an inmate, chef, this, that, and then a close ally of Putin rising up against the mm. Iron Man as Chinese people see, or even Xi Jinping sees Putin as a very strong man, Iron Man, and that image being shattered has its implication on the minds of the Chinese people as to whether there would be a future Prigozhin against Xi Jinping. Or not. So those questions are, and then suddenly they stopped the coverage mm -hmm. by the state media, and there are no other media that can cover that. Or they showed it only after the, the Prigozhin decided to leave to Belarus for uh, exile. So that is the level of control on information we are talking about, which is taken for granted in the free world. Uh, but tell me this idea of a coup, yeah. this suspicion of a coup. Is it uh, realistic given, uh, you know, Xi Jinping's control over the system? And go from where? From within the party or from the army? Well, this could be varied, you know. So, coup, the, the first thing I said about having to secure his permission for mm -hmm. more than three Politburo, then it becomes a majority. Yeah. And the second level is during Xi Jinping's time, particularly in the last four years, he has been changing every general, just like what Mao used to do mm -hmm. when he changed the Eastern Theater General to the Western, yeah. you know, swap the job. Similarly, uh, Xi Jinping is also transferring all the generals every single year. He doesn't. He makes sure that the generals don't build strong relationship mm -hmm. with the cadres. So that also is a paranoia to mm -hmm. rule out military coup. So it could be from anywhere political. Uh, this uh, from the public also again. China is the only country that spends more money on internal security yeah. than external security, particularly on security apparatus and, uh, and the apps that they use, you know, like electronic identification, geolocation, now even DNA profiling, iris scanning, and all that. So that itself manifests a deep distrust between the rulers and the ruled. Mm -hmm. And now 
according to this YouTuber, she was also talking about the large, the world's largest army in the world, you know, the, in terms of size. So these army people, at the initial stage of the formation of Communist Party, the party used to dictate who they can marry and who they can date with. And later there was a little more freedom. People mm. could choose their life partners. But now this is being reimposed. Even marriage in now, as to who you should marry, you can marry or who you can date with. That is what the YouTuber was saying and she sounded very uh, factual about this. So what is their um, uh, definition or uh, meaning of when who is the who is most compatible with the other? Is it loyalty to the party? Is that what matters? Which means you say that, of course, they will ho even the spouses or the, uh, the pe the people that you're dating, they will have to undergo background checks <laughs> to be uh, eligible to marry an army man so that all these uh, uh, whatever secrets of the government does not go out. So now with the counter espionage law also, everything is so contradictory. They want investment, but then you have the counter espionage mm -hmm. law. And just this morning, there was a report about a Chinese reporter just reporting about China's economy and comparing that with the depression of the 1930s. And then he's now not there. So what are your resources or the scholars you mentioned earlier? What are they telling you about the Chinese economy? Is it really going down? And a deep. Of course, there are a lot of uh, apprehensions on the uh, quality of Chinese data. Mm -hmm, yeah. so they always hide something. Uh, now they want to, in the free world, you can have access to all kinds of data and so you can make your analysis of yeah. what is happening. And China is clamping down more because now they make sure that all sensitive data that portray China as a weak economy or mm. economy not gaining traction or the contraction of economy and comparing uh, with other situations when there were bad things, all, everything could be a cause uh, for you to be arrested on the ground of national security and social stability. Because all the laws that Chinese government flames are very, very ambiguous. It's not well defined. So anybody can take decision at every level depending on whether you like that country or not, whether you like that company or not whether you like that person or not. So it all depends because on the one hand, they need the market. On the other hand, they put these restrictions. So everybody has to live in a kind of uncertainty. Even business people, they wonder, with the Japanese, they have already arrested some 17, 18 of yeah. their people already. And what does it say? How much, how longer will Japan be able to pursue with this policy of always have to confronting their people being arrested and seeking their release while running the business at the same time. Yeah. But that is why Japan has gone for plus one. Uh, China solution. plus one, yeah. China plus one solution, So, which many other countries might also follow because there are a lot of problems with decoupling, mm. too much investment. So that is why when people tell us, oh, the dragon is biting us, then we tell them who fed the dragon. And we, are, we were not able to tame the dragon. And then you say that the dragon is biting at you, and you're still feeding the dragon. You see so many European leaders from uh, Chancellor Scholz to President Macron to Wander Leon to Baerbock to Pistorius to all, all Asian <laughs> leaders going to China, yeah. now New Zealand Prime Minister is there, uh, President Lula also went. So you have the African Union participating in human rights discussions in Tibet with SCO members. Yeah. So all these are happening, aligning, realigning, uh, alignment, and all these developments are happening. But then what is the message for Russia, for, for China, for Europe? The main concern is Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And then you have this very deep relationship between Ukraine, Russia and China, mm -hmm. uh, whereas China needs European market because most of the European countries have trade deficit with China, including India. Yeah, but true. India has a huge trade deficit with China, particularly in the last one, two years, it has gone up from, the business volume has gone up from 79 to 118 billion or so. So as long as China have this excess of foreign exchange reserve, they will splurge it and they will use it against you. So you cannot complain that the dragon is yeah. biting at you because you are feeding the same dragon. Yeah. You think it's realistic uh, military coup in China? 
you think it's uh no, to anything can i think anything can spark anything because right now the the paranoia from the government is forcing the government to take certain steps which again uh, constricts the freedom of the people so the more you constrict people's freedom the more people are going to be wary of the government mm -hmm. not trust the government and then add to that the economic woes of the government where you have we already mentioned about rural banking housing and all that and then the falling uh, contraction in the economy uh so that is going to fuel when it comes to livelihood when it comes to the stomach you are talking already yeah. talking about 11.6 million young chinese between the age of 17 to 24 who are oh, unemployed mm. and they find for one some of them have even gone to foreign countries paid huge fees to study and come back mm. and then suddenly you are asked to go to the rural areas and work on the farm it's just like what Project. Is that true? They've been asked to go to the rural areas. There has been a lot of reports on that. Mm -hmm. They have not been because the, the, the cities are not able to provide them with employment. Mm -hmm. So then the only alternative is go to the villages to work on the farms, mm -hmm. and then having paid so much money, having spent so much time mm -hmm. to study mm -hmm. and try to seek a white collar job, mm -hmm. that is the Chinese dream, and then their dream is completely smashed now, mm -hmm. and then. 11.6 million may be small out of 1.4 billion but when you take 11.6 million as a force to reckon with they can create chaos so if there is anything economy is something that can really bring the chinese back on their knees so let's get back to tibet given china's economic situation do you see um, perhaps going forward um, a certain relaxation of the strict rules that following in tibet do you see kind of pulling back of the Chinese state from, you know, in the lives of ordinary Tibetans? That looks very unlikely. If you look at the incremental uh, repressive measures of the Chinese government, particularly during Xi Jinping's time, every amendment to available laws, prevailing laws, are being made more stricter, not looser. The indication could only come from those policies and programs. Uh, so. What we see uh, now, whether it's on con control of the use of religious areas or whether it's on control of the use of internet, uh, so everything is becoming more and more stringent. Mm -hmm. That makes it more difficult for people to exercise their freedom. Um, so it doesn't look very uh, likely that, uh, that uh, under the present circumstances things are going to change because Xi Jinping also have been saying that there's no need for us to change our system mm -hmm. because we have proven over the last two, three decades that we can have economic development under Communist Party. So that being a fact, they forget to look at, at every other aspect of human aspiration like what are people longing to, are they only looking for wealth or material wealth? Because for Chinese government, every problem, the solution is development, development, yeah. development, development, nothing else. So it's nothing to do with the religious aspirations of the people. Well, people have been deprived of this spirituality for the last so many decades. And now materially, they are much more better than before. They're, but then again, you have this spiritual vacuum. Mm -hmm. When Tibetan lamas go to Beijing, some of their patrons are communist leaders, <laughs> military leaders. They do uh, meet with them uh, secretly. So even they have to wonder whether there is life after death or not, uh, whether you believe in it or not, or whether you are religious or not. Ultimately, it boils down to that. Even Tao Ziyang, when he was dethroned and, and he had problems, when he died, he sent his son to for his holiness to pray for his father's soul. So you have all these contradictions in mm -hmm. it's not as ironed out as you know, as we tend to see from the outside. And this thing about the Dalai Lama's reincarnation, the party is heavily involved in trying to uh, get a solution. No, they are not a solution. They are more into creating future problems. Mm -hmm. So they know that Tibetan people are very religious, deeply devout Buddhists. So if they can control the Dalai Lama, then they can control the Tibetan population. Mm -hmm. 
So they are not bothered about the living 14th Dalai Lama, but they are more bothered about the yet to come yeah. 15th Dalai Lama. Do you think they've already identified somebody, some little boy? Not possible. They cannot. Mm -hmm. They cannot. That is why when I was asked by some foreign diplomats as to you don't seem to have a process in place mm -hmm. uh, regarding His Holiness uh, selection and all that. That is for something for His Holiness to decide because it's His Holiness who is going to be reborn. Yep. I cannot decide as a CTA leader or any other government mm -hmm. for that matter. And this is a purely religious uh, uh, and ritualistic matter. So it is best uh, left to people whom His Holiness entrusts to carry on the uh, responsibility. So my message to the Chinese government is, have you not learned enough lesson from the Benjamin Lama saga? Yeah. Mm. Because you have two three boys out of the three boys one was selected by his holiness the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. and then he was abducted and along with his family we still don't know whether he's alive or not even if he's alive whether he has been given the traditional education to carry on his responsibilities or not and then you have the Chinese select pension Lama when he was sent to Tibet you have to pay the people to go and listen to him meet mm -hmm. him you have to force the civil servants to make it compulsory for them to see uh, the Chinese selected pension lama. So you don't see this respect from the Tibetan people. Uh, they just call him another, he's a Tibetan boy, of course, he, they just call him another political leader, mm -hmm. not respected as pension lama. So you don't see pictures of the Chinese selected pension lama to be sold on the market, yeah. in the market. You see only the tenth pension lama. So that is how Tibetans show their displeasure or not accepting the Chinese choice. It is a government that does not believe in religion or spirituality, and interfering in the process of selection itself is quite, uh, I don't know, such a, <laughs> such a contradiction yeah. that, that it's, it's difficult to place it in a very realistic or uh, rational sense. But that is what Chinese government always does. And my response to this was uh, that uh, China cannot handle unpredictability, just like mm -hmm. with Trump. Uh, that's why His Holiness also saying it could be a rebirth, it could be a emanation, it could be a woman when he's asked. So China is confused. So that's why right now the decision that His Holiness has taken is very wise. Because once His Holiness decides, then they will use. China has all the resources, mm -hmm. financial and human. So then they will try to influence the international community you know, to follow their... Uh, but they cannot just appoint one person. There has to be a time. So last question. You deal with the Indian government. What is it that you would ask of them or in your discussions with them, what is it that you seek? I mean... Um, uh, whether in terms of the Tibetan diaspora here, you know, mm. what is it that you uh, would wish for them to... Uh... <clears throat> the Indian government uh, and the people of India have been very kind to us. We have our historical relationship, as I mentioned before, our first king of yeah. Tibet came from India. So we have all these, we feel like an extension. I, I tell our friends, so I look, I mean, look a little different because I'm a Tibetan, but our mind is all the same. Mm -hmm. It is shaped by Indian philosophy and thinking. So uh, humanitarian issues, is the, the, the Indian government has been very, very kind. Uh, when it comes to political issues concerning China, earlier when that question used to be posed to His Holiness, His Holiness always used to say India is overcautious. Now I say we can remove the over, yeah. but still cautious. Yeah. And I think uh, in, in international politics and looking at the national interests of uh, government of India, uh, uh, there, there needs to be due diligence and uh, uh, discerning power to take the right decision. But then if they can be a little more assertive about their position on, the, on, on Tibet, uh, like the boundary issue, the... I say India is not saying it, yeah. but the fact that India still uses Indo-Tibetan border police and Indo-Tibetan border force, not changing it to Sino-Indian border yeah. police, yeah. That, that itself underlines or underscores what India really wishes it to be. So, But then His Holiness has uh, uh, taken on this uh, middle way policy because he thinks more about the common interest rather than individual interest. And if we can 
have a non-violent, negotiated, mutually beneficial, lasting solution to the Sino-Tibet conflict on that plateau through the middle way or genuine autonomy for Tibetans, then we are, I tend like to believe that even the border issue should, should be resolved. So if that happens, then there will be much more peace and stability because we have played the role of a buffer historically yeah. between the two most populous nations in the world. There was never a world war between China and India because of Tibet. And Tibetans have so much respect for Indians that there's, there's never ever been a war. So we are willing to play the role of a bridge in future if there is a resolution to the Sino-Tibet conflict and promote more stability in the region. So on that hopeful note, Pepper Sering, uh, thank you very much for speaking to Spread News Global. Thank you. And I hope we can have many more such conversations in future. Thank you so much, Surya. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So that's all we have for you now on The Gist. Uh, do tune in for more such conversations going forward. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.